Sorry for Kenny. Probably there was another reason why they took Barry to death and said the man was swallowing a Kenny. Who in their right mind will kill any human being for Kenny? If you are not mad, if you are in full possession of your senses and faculties. You know? So, the Lebanese people were left, let out, I think, some people said they escaped during a coup attempt or some, something, but whatever the case is, the chief justice who has statutory responsibility, his son was the lawyer. For the Lebanese. For the Lebanese. My next question to that is, we've heard different versions of what happened in 1979, and we even heard your part of it. But the question I'd like to ask, was there really a demonstration? Did yeah. people carry banners? Did people carry placards? Were yeah, people, people chasing were singing, to get in the street? People were singing I was at the power office. And you know, at, at that time, 90% of my brain was aluta. Yes, and I didn't want to miss it. I was in it to my throat. So I went there, first thing in the morning. I was there, nobody was on the street, and then by eight, nine, people started gathering. And then there was a huge, huge crowd before Powell's office. You know, Powell's office used to be around, uh, what's that street name? That inquiry on. Oh, Gurley. Gurley Street, eh? Yes, yeah. Gurley Street. On the other side. And a lot of people came. And then we decided to come ahead. I decided to come ahead because I knew their, their travel path. You know, I was running ahead of them. There was a demonstration. I'm not talking about the midnight. I'm not talking about the midnight demonstration. But on that day, there was a demonstration. How come that huge crowd, you know, went amok when the first shots came from state security? You know, it was a shooting. And then when the AFL came, for the first time, the AFL took side with the demonstrator. They didn't like the fact that, you know, probably the police people were killing our people. So the, 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 the security forces disappeared from the street. Only the demonstrators and the AFL remained. And the shots were looted. You know, I was on the street. I went home around 6 o'clock. In fact, I almost got killed, you know, by an AFL soldier who said that, you know, curfew broke me. But my life was saved by a quarter, 25 cents. I took it from my pocket, extended it to him. He could hardly stand, but the M16 also were in my chest. And I was like, God. Don't let that ball press that trigger. Because I was finished. The M16 was really, really, really going to devastate me. So the demonstrators left the confines of the power office and went into the street to demonstrate. And yes. the police tried to stop them from advancing, maybe to the mansion or wherever they were going. Exactly. Okay. They fired on them. They didn't even have police on the street trying to stop them with like the way we do now. No, they didn't have the riot gears and all that kind of thing. There were sharpshooters all over the place. So the guys came to kill. Vanny Dempster and his boys came to kill. People were buried that day. I think uh, some of your inquiry people were trying to ask Kankala where he thought some of the April 14 people were buried. There were mass graves, several mass graves. There were other people who were killed in some other areas, maybe in the suburbs. But I don't, I don't have too much details about that. But there is, there, there's a mass, mass grave on Gallery Street. In the St. Gallery Street area. Right. There is an account that um, the police director actually fired in the air. And when he was lowering his pistol, yes. that's when his picture was taken. And then it was published and gave the impression that he shot into the crowd. He shot into the crowd. Right at the Ministry of Defense, S.A. Street. I was there. My eyes were wide open. I had a camera. I didn't take his picture because when the shooting started, you know, I didn't want to play some kind of journalistic hero and go get in the way of the bullet. So I, I myself was trying to find some hiding. You know, but I saw the guy who was hit bleeding and people taking him away and then the crowd started to spread. 
and people started to loot and then the looting continued the whole day then the Guinean troops or the MiG started to fly and things were happening I would like to understand the organization that supported the former general to come in 1985 if there are, you did call some names but if there are institutions connected Will you speak to that? And his widow has been talking a lot about his death, his activities. Was she involved with the movement? And then you spoke about Archie Williams coming in with money. Can you say who was bankrolling his operations? I don't know. And I, that was not my concern at the time. But he, that boy was full of cash. He was always at a gambling center. You know, part, partly that's why the thing failed because the money he brought, he was gambling. He was not accountable to anybody. He gave the people some money. I don't know how much. And like I said, when I entered that thing, I was not concerned with money and a lot of discussions. I wanted when he said you you for training. I was just waiting for the training. I'm an operational man. I just wanted to get my training for probably for future purposes because the way our country was going people were being killed by gun violence used by people from the state and all kinds of things I thought it was good for me to get my military training and that it would help me you know to put me in a better frame of mind I'm not trying to be a romanticist but I was part of the coup I was recruited by Kuomba and, and, and uh, through uh, Fambulet I was at the University of Liberia then. You sent a couple of men to Libya. Yes. For training and then the Libyans wanted you all to integrate with the Taylor forces. Yes. Uh, the question is, do you know how many men Taylor had in Libya at the time? 24. Taylor had 24 men. Yes. And then Dubon tried to recruit you to join Charles Taylor and you said no. Yes. Did you get to know later on how or why he was killed or how he died? I understand he and Taylor were struggling over diamonds. Or you were trying to question some diamond deals. I don't have facts on that. And for me those were all rumors. But the special forces Taylor himself probably wiped out a couple of them, so you know, revolution started eating its own children. You are you have a lot of information or you are a security expert if I may say. And given your involvement with the process, you might have heard of a lot of security operations that went on in the country at the time. I don't know if you remember the late Minister Patrick Minico. Yes, I remember that name. And there is this theory that Patrick Minico was, I think, killed at a conference he was attending on behalf of Liberia, and that he and Grady Addison were two targets, opposition to do wanted to be removed from around him to weaken his position. Have any information? I have no information whatsoever. No information. I just heard that name, Patrick Minico. Uh, he died at some conference. That's it. In 1985, Thomas Marquis. Yes. It was rumored that uh, the late president was captured and Thomas Marquis was. The person left in charge. Was Anthony Marquis. Oh, sorry. Anthony Marquis. Yes. Can you say something about that? Was the president ever captured? Do you no. guys go any close to the marquee? Anthony Marquis did not capture anybody. No. He didn't he didn't betray Kuomba. No, I don't think so. They captured him later on that day. And he was in his brief. I saw I saw a clip from that time where he was in just brief, you know, that day. He was captured by the security forces and he might have probably spoken on the radio, but nobody handled Doe and then left him again. I think Doe 
according to intelligence I received, left and went towards either Firestone or some place. He didn't sleep. I mean, he didn't sleep in Monrovia. He didn't. He was not in Monrovia on that on that day. Probably they had prior knowledge of what was going to go down. I don't know. But I don't think Doe was uh, leaving and we caught him. No, we never caught Doe. Nobody caught him. But almost 70% of the ministerial staff of Doe were, were on um, arrest. And interestingly, strangely, we did not kill any of them. Because Kuomba would not allow anyone to kill them. You spoke of Lurch SOP. Yes. Is it possible for us to get a copy of that instrument? I've been out of there's one. Yes, I've been out of there since 2002. But I will try to find out if I can get a copy. Yeah, this, the SOP, I mean, it was almost like a mini Geneva Convention. You know, don't steal from the people. In fact, and when they, when you meet them, don't take their, their, their materials. Don't take their women. And I think uh, Charles then may have been on record for punishing people severely who trouble civilians. Uh, something I didn't say here, and it will not be fair to the people of Kolahun. I think it was on either 26th Eve or 26th day or Christmas day, 2001, that the government forces killed about 200 people in Kolahun when Lord forces retreated from there. That was after the death of Charles Dent. Uh, According to information I received, probably a, a few weeks after that incident, the, the chief in the area was so upset about the deaths that he told every able-bodied bandit man to join the lair. So lots of people joined the lair. And that changed the dynamics of the fight. The bandits came and they were fighting with sufficient vestation. And they were the cream of the force that came to Monrovia. The bandit people were upset and they joined the lair. A lot of, there were a lot of bandit fighters. But when we came to Monrovia, in the division of the jobs, I don't think the bandy people got their fair share. The dominance of the crowns and the mandingos, they arrogated to themselves most of the proceeds from that division of the ministerial stuff. Uh, I think Vamba Kane might be a bandy man, but he played his own role as a uh, former acting chairman of the lab when he was in his formative stage before he gave way to Henson William, then Jumande, and then um, how do you call him? Our Siku Kone came in later on. Yes. Yeah, but the Bandit people fought the war. The Crowns and the Mandingos were supervising, you know, at the leadership level, but the Bandits were angry. They had the heavy weapons and they were coming to town. The shooting, they started from Kolawun, they didn't stop until they took the port. In response to me to my next question, which has to do with the leadership structure of LERD, you spoke of different personalities at different times. Right. And most likely all of the former chairpersons. Right. But what did the structure look like and who were the people filling these positions? Charles Benin was, was, was another popular name. Was he it was involved? a spokesman who was in all and talking. Okay. Yes, but Charles Benin came to Guinea, I think once or twice, and went to Vanjama to see the leadership. But he was always in Europe, talking. Like me, I was always talking from New Carrollton, Maryland, all 450. And then when I say, oh, uh, Robin, I'm at the foot 
of the Wologisi Mountain. And we are going to fight for 100 more years until I don't leave Liberia. And everybody believed I was really at the foot of the Wologisi Mountain. I wasn't there. You're in Maryland? Yeah. The USA? Yeah. So can we talk a little bit about the leadership structure? Coming the leadership from structure was like this. Sekou Kone Chair, uh, Chaido Vice Chair for Administration. And when he died, who replaced him? When he died, we were almost near dissolution. Oh, okay. Yeah, when he maneuvered and everybody were doing their own thing in their own little corner. You know, when Chai died, peace be yeah. unto his soul. Yeah. Chai do vice chairman for administration. Labla Suku, vice chairman for operation. Yeah. Uh, how do you call him? Aze Jinamu became secretary general. Yeah. And director of war. <laughs> yeah. Soko Sako was the chair for the NEC committee, the National Executive Council Committee on Defense and Security. So probably he had oversight responsibility when it came to the military thing. Okay. I was the senior military advisor and spokesman. But let me tell you how I got the job. The senior military advisor job. When they were dividing the jobs initially in Freetown, I refused to attend the meeting. And because I knew you know, rebel position is not a good position. You can get yourself killed by the position you take. I knew, given the experience of Albert Carpet, if I opted for the leadership, I would not be here talking to you. So I told them, I am not part of the political leadership. I want to be I'm a military man. I got military experience. So they said, boy, you are important and we got to find you something. So which job do you want? I said, I want to be an advisor. So in order to deal with all these knucklehead rebel generals, I had to have a rank. And it had to be general rank because the way I envisaged my role was like I was supposed to chastise people if they did wrong. But the reality got different when members of the NEC got suspicious of me and decided to make me stay in Conakry with them and advise them on military matter in the NEC. Well, we're discussing nothing about the military. <laughs> So when Sekou Kone went in the bush, he had one general, Abbas, as a senior military advisor, I didn't even know. But I was, I was more functional with respect to speaking out because I had a journalistic talent that I was using and that has been my weapon throughout the war. One day, uh, I went, I was leaving Julie Bryan's office during the interim and the press people asked me the same question. I think somebody asked me about the arms yesterday. When will you disarm? Where are the big guns? And I said, I'm the only rebel in Liberia who has never disarmed. And I might probably never be disarmed. Oh, and these guys got interested in what I said. They thought that it was sensational. Joe Wiley refuses to decide what's going to be the headline the next day. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, the weapons I have been fighting with 
in this world are still with me. My mouth is my BZT, my computer is my AA, and my cell phone is my AK. Nobody has taken those things from me. I still got them. So I still got my weapons I used during the war. And everybody laughed and joked about it and left. You know, so I was more interested in trying to, because when I spoke, I believe I had three audiences. Liberian people were wary of war when this little thing started. But that was because we didn't do our homework as a nation. I'm not going to pour all the blame on Taylor alone. And probably Equus slipped a little bit on the security sector issue. You know, we did not come to Liberia because we didn't have a cause. We were just a bunch of trigger happy people who wanted to inflict pain on other people. No. I think, Mr. Chairman, all of the confessions and data you have gathered in the course of your work justify to me, in my view, that the fight against Charles Taylor from 2000 to 2003 was a legitimate political project where people are oppressed by a dictator. They have no choice, no chance of redress. People are beaten even in a democracy. In 1999, I think I saw a State Department report, country report, in which it said 100 people died in and around Monrovia just from killings, people finding bodies in the river, in the beach, on the beach. You know, uh, Chucky was in Monrovia, all kinds of guys were in Monrovia. I don't know who was killing the people. Doki died around that same time. But I read a report and said to myself, if 100 people die less than half mile or one mile away from where our state is a minister, people are finding bodies on the beaches, in the river. It means that the country is still at war in a slow motion fashion. I was really, really upset about that report. You know, you don't run a democracy and use brute force to keep people online. People are kept online by incentives. Governance in Liberia has not gone properly. And I want to quote a, a, a young Liberian writer. I, I don't want to say young because I haven't met him. His name is Usman Martin Tamba. I always enjoy his writings. He said, There's a curse that perpetually haunts Liberia. That curse gets worse. Every year, every decade. And when you think that it is about to recede, something happens that reinforces that curse and brings it up to the fore. It's the curse of leadership. We have acute leadership problems in Liberia. In my study of management and politics, I believe leadership is the cause, everything else is effect. If a leader has the right frame of mind, even where the honor men are doing stupid things, you can set the tone, 
set the example and if they see you going the right way everybody will want to act in that way if the fish begins to get rotten from the head you can't save it so Liberia has an acute leadership problem Thank you, and sir. governance in Liberia has to be looked at properly and we have to know the various segments of governance and I'm glad we have a governance commission that is talking about decentralization that is talking about security sector reform I have collaborated with the GC through the African Security Sector Network to help work on the national security strategy of Liberia. We don't have one. We don't have, we have scanty laws about our security services. We don't have something comprehensive that you will bounce all the other acts on. Am I protected, Mr. Chairman? Very well, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'd like you to speak on the fighting, the strength of uh, Lord and uh, the percentage of quote unquote child soldiers, children associated with um, factions that were involved uh, with your movement. And I try to say that um, there is a section of our work that's going to focus on the security sector and the reform. I was just thinking whether you would be in a position to participate. Very well. I'm available. Okay. Once I'm in the country, call on me. Anything that has to do with security and to make this place better, I'm game. Commissioner but Stewart has oversight for that, so I was trying to... Very good. I will, I will give him... I can even bring you out some literature, That's some very good literature that will help us along the way. Uh, on the question you asked, the full the full strength, the full strength cannot right. be determined so easily. We had a problem in Accra. Law was not a conventional army. We sent initially there were 117 men with 84 rifles that were in the bush. By the time the second day of fighting came, most of them had their looted property coming across the border and were left with close to 35 men in a bush. You know, and so that was one of the reasons why most of the most advanced fighters from Freetown were coming. But there were too many combatants in Conakry. Especially when we were doing a gender operation, there was no need for child soldiers. All of the guys who were in Yulimo LPC, they are rich of age. Probably when they were child soldiers, they were child soldiers before in their original mother units. But they were adults. Now, if I said there were not children with the fighting forces, I would be like, but I was never really around in the bush to determine the full strength. Also, so we never answer that question because they needed it in Accra also. It is difficult. And that is why I say when you're thinking about a rebel group, do not think of it as a conventional force where they can do air count, you know, and do all this kind of thing. You can place three men right here. When you come back, they could be 100 with only three rifles. So there were a lot of guys without arms, you know, who came to join to hustle. Some people came in to look for food, to associate. And you know when war is still on somewhere, sometimes it becomes the biggest single employer. You know, all the girls want to go hustle the commandos, you know, because, you know, that's, that's where the part could ball for that, for that time. So people were coming into the organization. But to say that probably when when Siku Kone comes here, and he, he called me from Freetown, and he told me he has been cited to the TRC. I told him to come if you want. 
you know, will help you prepare something for you to go talk. Because I know the man will not by himself be able to prepare, you know, the, the stuff there. Yeah. Uh, no, let's be realistic. Somebody needs to help him. Or he just come here and just speak from his guts. That's, that's I think it would be preferable like I did yesterday. I, I only read my, my text for about 15, 20 minutes. And I, I put it aside and just went on. The initial, the beginning would be, uh, but when you start to flow and just follow your thoughts. You know, and look for friendly folks and emphasis in the audience who will give you reassurance that you are not talking nonsense. <laughs> you know, yeah. but when Seku Kone come here, comes here, he will answer that question. But I don't have any food. I was not near the forces. When we were in exile in Freetown, yes, you know, but it was even hard to tell because we're mixed with a lot of Sierra Luneans. And we're scattered over a wide area. So they said, but I know that we had first and second brigade of the land. First brigade was responsible to mine the real base, I mean to, to, to guide our back route. Because the fight in the in that Paris big area was intense. There were too many rebel organizations there. Our UF was there hiding out with arms and looted from the UN and other people. You know, Babu Zumaniki and his boys were there. Dennis Mingo was, was there. Then we got there. But all of these other militias that were not part of the land were supported by the MPFL. You know, they used to ferry, helicopter, carry them supplies after we caught the route, the, the rollings. So Lord had only two brigades? Two brigades, yes. In conventional sense, brigades? A brigade is uh, a skeleton brigade. In the guerrilla sense, we make anywhere between one to 2,000 men. But somebody can take 500 men and form a brigade. Depending on the experience of those 500 men, they can do the work of probably 2,000 men if they deploy themselves properly and they have their basic load. There was an attempt to create a third brigade in Nimba, Ganta. But that brigade didn't really take off. It only, had, it only became important for it to do that operation to stop mosquitoes from coming to Monrovia. Because we could not allow that route to stay open. We wanted Taylor to go dry with his ammunition, you know, so that when we put a chokehold on the city, and then we can negotiate. That was. Those of us who were in the land, who opted for negotiation, wanted to, to just put a chokehold on the city and then say, Equas, yes, what do you say? We got Mr. Taylor by the balls now. What do you say? Can we go in town? No. So that's what, that's what happened. But Lloyd had two brigades. The okay. third brigade was not uh, uh, really a serious uh, brigade in my, in my view. Okay. But it was a skeletal thing there. Thank you very much. How widespread was the use of substance, if you like, drugs? Uh, not necessarily within LERD, but from your experience of armed conflict in the Manor River Basin and in the Liberian conflict. I know most of the people take real stuff, man. What do you mean real stuff? I'm talking about the injured dust. What is injured? The white woman. You know what I call the white woman? No, I'm just hearing it for the first time. Cocaine. Or crack. They call it, anytime you hear what, that's why I say people like, oh, you need to, we can listen on the street, we hear conversation, we know what they are talking about. When they say white woman, it's cocaine. Because it's white like flower. But cocaine was widely used in the Labyrinth War. I don't know why other substances, there were, there are times, the other rebel fashion used gunpowder. They use what? Gunpowder. I know for a fact that if you fire the AK-47 for 30 minutes to one hour, you will get high. Because the smoke that is coming up is getting in your nose and you will not know. Because the gunpowder is kind of toxic. You know, so as you fire, you keep 
getting, you know, getting your idea together. You know, that's what the guys were doing. So gunpowder was used. Then, as for marijuana, forget it. The RUS were plenty, plenty it in Foya. That was their farm. They were selling it. Sometimes there they left was a fire battle over the marijuana farm. See who will get this and see. Are you ever spending that in Foya? Planting that thing. And the stuff they planted, according to the left fighters, they call it good poo poo. That's the marijuana. Yeah. We heard in the early 90s or something, I think it was tablets, the fighters used to call bubbles. Yes, Valium. Oh, that was Valium? Yeah. Oh. They take sufficient and overdose themselves and it hits their nervous system and they get high on it. You give some guys, can, they have no substance to take, they will smoke banana leaves. It will soak? They will smoke banana leaves. Oh, you burn the banana leaves. The dry leaves. ones. Yeah. Substances were used. Ah, uh, okay. Um, voodoo. Medicine, superstition, all of those. Exactly. Ziki and all of that. You, I don't know how widespread was that. And this comes against the background that a lot of rituals went on. You spoke of Libya, and we heard of cannibalism, the extraction of people's hearts. And you mentioned that before you went uh, for a battle, I think Asha Conan put something around your waist. Yes, during the battle for Masanta. Yeah, she put she something around me, your waist. She came to me, she said, you came for America to help us. I got something here for you. And she took her, her zikri from her own waist and put it around my waist. It gave me a false sense of uh, protection. I couldn't refuse that. I didn't have to believe it. But it was around my waist the whole day. You know, when the Iron Lady gave you sickly, you can't refuse it, my friend. Yes, she helped me. So later on, she and I left. And when we got, I think the Colonel Chris, she demanded her sickly back. <laughs> I was glad to give it back to her because I, don't, I didn't want that thing to turn to snake around my waist in the night. Besides that, uh, within LERD itself and other forces with MPF or why, do you have any information of how much people relied on voodoo? Oh, I saw them put it around your hands, especially some of the Madingo chaps. You know, the one we call in Sapo Nemo. You put it around your hands, it's like a banker, but you tie it up here. And it is there to protect you. Some people put their stuff around their waist. Uh, and some people went one whole month without taking bath. Yeah, it's certain exactly when you have it, you can't take bath. So when you are all the way to Raxi Cinema, you are older or rich here. Burkina uh, Faso, especially Blaise Kampuari, played a very important role in um, the MPFL prosecution of his war. Yes. And there were theories that Liberian commandos were involved with the assassination of uh, former President Thomas Sankara, and that paved the way for Blaise to get to the helm of leadership in Burkina Faso. Is there any truth to this? What I heard was that, what's his name, Sankara refused to allow the Charles Tiller project to go on because he said Burkina Me territory should not be used to destroy another African country. But at the time that Tiller got free out of jail, Blaze and Sankara had a quarrel and Chikata and Rollins were mediating. But they used to go to Ghana for the mediation. One person would go talk to Rollins and Chikata because Rollins had a battalion called the Sankara Battalion. Then the other person would come. So Prince Johnson and others, from what I heard, were on their way. 
to Tripoli when the thing happened. So they aided the Burkina Bay forces in the assassination of uh, Thomas Sankara for Blaze to come. Because apparently Blaze must have told them that this man is obstructing the operation. You got to help me. So they need an experience hands to do that you know but there was there was Liberian involvement okay thank you sir um, my last question thank you for the last question <laughs> Lawrence seems to take a lot of credit for the eventual departure of former president Charles Tito. I was just wondering what's your perspectives on the impact of sanctions, the arms embargo, and the political actions of the opposition, and then the coming of uh, Model. How did all of that contribute? Or does Lloyd take the singular credit for Taylor's departure? No. What? It took a big international conspiracy of countries and individuals to destroy Liberia. So it took another concerted effort. The United Nations sanctions really, really bit Taylor. So I have to give credit to the US and Britain for being steadfast at the United Nations while France were calling for constructive engagement with Taylor that he would change his behavior and attitude. But the U.S. put their foot down that the sanctions must be brought down on Taylor. And if Taylor, believe me, if Taylor had enough ammunition, probably by now we are still fighting. So a big portion of the credit goes to the UN, United Nations Security Council, for putting sanction arm embargo on Liberia. It was violated at some point in time by Taylor, through Veta Boo and all kinds of people. The next group of people who deserve credit are the civil society and religious leaders because they took blows. Journalists were killed for speaking the truth. Your own member here, Trabusua, was flocked for allegedly sending an email by the ATU. He, he was sick. He couldn't walk. People had to help him to go to the hospital. So there were many people who made their voices heard and took the risk, you know, to confront Charles Taylor to do the right thing by the Liberian people. Some of them, their action were influenced by the fact that they didn't want another rebel war to come. Then there is the sub-region, ECOWAS, and, uh, and Nigeria specifically, and Ghana, they play a very critical role in bringing this conflict to an end. And it is the combination of UN sanction, the role of the church and civil society, the student movement, the ECWA subregion, and the help the lawyer gave Taylor to move. I think we helped him to, go, to get out. He needed some help. You know, and we had to push him a little bit. But I saw some report. I don't know how true it may be. I saw a report one time that any, in 2000, any opposition to Charles Taylor without a military component would not yield any fruit. So people anticipated that once Taylor denied here by the peace accord, there might, there will be a definite resurrection of the command structure of the old Ulimo J, K, and other people. So by 1998, Terquia and others were already 
putting the fundamentals of that structure together because they were being chased. Manazeke was killed. You know, people were being harassed. The MPFL got in government uniforms and army uniforms and started chasing their former enemies. The very thing the Abuja Accord was signed to prevent. The Lord, we lost 600 men fighting in Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia. Those men paid the ultimate sacrifice for us to come home, but they were not the only ones that contributed. Others contributed. We have to sufficiently thank the U.S. Because when they finally came around, they, they went after sanctions at the United Nations. France was trying to play filibuster a little bit, but they helped out a lot. So it's a combination of both external help and internal resistance to Charles Taylor that brought about this victory. This victory is also for Maswe Kobe. The former Nigerian army officer who organized the law, spent the money, gave us, gave us political protection in Freetown and made us to stand on our feet. He believed that the only way we can relegate Charles Taylor to the past tense of the grammar of West African politics was by forming a Liberian group that would, that would take on Charles Taylor so that he can listen to the only language he can understand. Would it have mattered if ECOMOC had stayed and the peace agreement at the time was implemented to the forest where the armed where, forces right. had been restructured? We wouldn't have September 18, that's number one. I was not going to get involved with that. Because once I sign any agreement on the auspices of the sub-region, sub I'm one of those guys who want to adhere to that. When we left Accra and came to Monrovia, they were attempt to take us back to Bombay Hills as a leadership group. I say, my friend, I was fighting to catch the city where I grew up. I'm here. Anybody want to go to Bombay Hill, you're on your own. Bombay Hill is not for me. Yes, we captured the town, but it's not our town. Leave that town, come to Monrovia. Any discussion we want to have, we have it here. If we stick in the bush too much, the people will think we have different intentions. So let's stay in town. I never went back to Bombay Hills. And I encourage other people not to go there. And that's how the whole leadership, because the contention was that if we still stick, stick, stick in Bombay Hill as a leadership group, you know, people will give us more respect. I said a lie. Your respect will come from your performance within the interim government and your commitment to the process. And the reason why it was very difficult for the lies that were told from NSA and other places that and Prince Johnson was able to be used himself as an outlet for the lies that I was in Cote d'Ivoire training people to come and attack Liberia. In, 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 I was about to outdo my baby when I got my fellowship to write a book and went to Guinea. I mean, Ghana. Why would I leave my almost $24,000, $25,000 project that King's College London, the African Security Sector Network, uh, uh, and uh, uh, um, in Ghana gave me to go to Cote d'Ivoire? So I told them I'm not Napoleon Bonaparte. The United Nations people that were here, they and I worked together for two years on the security of this country. 
I was acting defense minister for almost uh, 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 one year. Kochi was always away, and when he had a chance, they dropped him from the sanction list. He went to the States to see his family. I was on my own. I was running my show. And I performed. I worked with the United Nations system. During that period, because of my work with the United Nations system, it was difficult for anybody to convince them that after doing work for Liberia to stabilize the place, until election, I will go to Cote d'Ivoire to go bring another war. It was difficult. Somebody went to the SRSG when that allegation came up. And the intention of that lie was to make me afraid not to come back home. Wish hunting takes several forms. You know, so the UN, the UN know, for example, they have given me the airplane to go to Freetown together with Dr. Jabo to sign a memorandum of understanding to bring 100, I mean 435 AFL soldiers and other Taylor Malaysia back to Monrovia to take part in the restructuring process. Because I told Chairman Bryant that it would be a security gap to leave those guys out. Therefore, Sierra Leone and Liberia signed a memorandum of understanding. The, the soldiers and, and, and combatants were in turn. In turn is a word used for people who are not refugees, nor political prisoners. You know, the, the soldiers who just said, look, we don't want to fight because Lord left them at the border and took Douala. So it looked like they caught their own sin. They decided to cross the border and put their arms down. They put them down. The UN took me to Freetown. We did a memorandum of understanding at the State House. I did an interview on Army Radio in Freetown, in which a many journalists always talk about this interview, in which I said, now that this war is over, we are coming to Sierra Leone to get our former combatants. We hope that other people will follow this step because there are other combatants of Liberia, but we are not doing the negotiations. And we need to bring money in this region to solve our problem, our social problem, poverty problem. And I made a comment that money does not like money. I mean, money does not like noise, especially noise coming from AK-47. And do you know that the Sierra Leoneans always tell each other today that Joe Wiley said money does not like noise. I mean, they just took it and ran away with it. I didn't, I didn't realize the importance of the statement I was making. Until I went in town and other people started repeating it to me and people started calling each other. My friend, Joe Wiley said money does not, money is a smooth operator. When you fire one round in Manuria today, or one magazine, people will start millions of dollars from being transferred to this country. So let's watch the situation small in the next six months. So I have played a role. I brought them by, I gave them the skill training certificate. They were trained. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, are you trying to cut me off, Mr. Chairman? I, I want to give you a chance to say a last word. No, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, you already finished giving me some consultancy work. You know that I have to come and do so probably. You can save all of that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Honorable Joe Wale, we want to thank you very much for coming and spending two days with the Commission and sharing your rich experiences with us. Your recommendations, your presentation, your analysis, your historical reflections have all added value to our work. Now that your testimony has come to an end, we want to thank you very much and ask you if you have any final word for the Commission or the people of Liberia. The final words I have for all of us is that we need to put this country first in anything we do. We need to be real patriots. 
we need to develop a sense of nationalism. We need to liaise with the sub-region so that we do concerted efforts as a nation to check the activities of transnational criminal organizations as well as armed groups that are operating. But more than that, I want to use this opportunity to say to many people in Liberia who suffer, not necessarily as a result of my own action, but as a result of all of the actions of other combatants, I am a living victim of the war. And in my victimhood, I decided to do something about this country. So I'm a participant observer. I lost my mother. I lost three of my brothers. I lost 68 members of my family, my extended family, in my family town, plus, and I lost some very important friends. If at any time in the, in the execution of this war, especially from 2002, and even in 1985, I did anything that brought pain and suffering to any Liberian or any foreigner within our borders. I want to say I'm sorry from the bottom of my heart. The strength of a man is not determined by his height, it's not determined by the, the thickness of his muscles, especially his uh, biceps. The strength of a man is determined by his ability to say, I'm sorry. And once I say I'm sorry, I would say sorry to my family. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you very much. I want to end right here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Chuluwane, for coming to the commission. We appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I wanted to say sorry to my daughter. And that was what brought tears to my eyes. I want to promise here 
that never again would I be involved in any violent struggle. I promise my daughter. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm sorry guys. Yes.